Heavenly Father, I thank you that our holiday time has come and that it will be an opportunity for many of us to relax, take some time off, be with family and friends if, God, if you allow. But under their current circumstances, Father, it will still be different. We ask, Lord, that you'll keep us safe and help us move through this period of the holidays without trial, without difficulty, uh, with a, a chance, Father, to enjoy it for what it's intended to be without distraction. I hope, Father, you give us more people to join us in this study as we go on, even if uh, there are reasons why some can't be here. We ask, Father, that you would continue to take the word as we preach it and teach it and move it outward through the world in any way you wish. And let us, Father, be faithful to uh, continue not only learning it, but applying it. Thank you, Father, for the support that you've brought to this church, to this ministry, and all that we do. Thank you, Father, for those who pray for us and encourage us and support us in many ways. And uh, thank you, Father, that we do all of these things because you equip us, you call us into ministry, call us into your body, Father. You do all these things for your own glory. We're uh, amazed, Father, that you have work uh, that you believe we can be a participant in when we know you don't need anything but it is a, a blessing to be a part of it. Father, thank you for the, all of those blessings and for our night ahead in study. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's get back. We're in our study of David's failings. That's this section of 2 Samuel in which the author has focused on the failings, the shortcomings of David in his time as king. He organized this book, if you remember, not chronologically, but in order to focus on sections in his reign, starting with the good and then moving to the bad, if you will. The first section was David's rise to power and all the ways in which he triumphed. And then that second section, which we started in chapter nine, is now focused on the cumulative effect of some of David's mistakes and how they impacted him and how they impacted the nation. This uh, section has several examples, the longest of which we're currently studying. These are the failings of David and his family, stemming first from his choice to take multiple wives, and then uh, continuing because of the effect of how he chose to respond to his sons. You have multiple wives, and from that you have multiple sons from different mothers, and then from that you end up with incest, uh, uh, incestual lust to rivalries and conflict, and we've been studying this now for a while. And if all of that weren't bad enough, you have David compounding the problem by failing to hold his sons accountable for their misdeeds. And in the last case of what we studied, he was failing to show forgiveness, failing to show mercy, breeding resentment, ultimately rebellion in one of his sons, in Absalom. We're in the middle of that story. So we're gonna come back to that now in chapter 14, the turmoil of Absalom, David's oldest living son at this point. Remember, he's the one who murdered his brother, Amnon. He fled then to his grandfather's home in Geshur, and now he's returned to Jerusalem after three years of exile. His son, David's son, Absalom, he expected when he came back he'd have his father's forgiveness, but David apparently is unwilling to give that forgiveness to his son. And so, as we read last time at the end of our last study, verse 28 of chapter 14, we ended there. Absalom lived two full years in Jerusalem and did not see the king's face. So, after his return, he's ignored by David for two years. He's barred from David's presence. He's not even able to eat at the king's table with his own father. You know, even Saul's descendant Mephibosheth is eating at the king's table every day. But David's oldest son and the presumptive heir is not. So David is enforcing a, a kind of justice on his son that is neither just nor effective. I mean, the law did not stipulate that if you murder that the punishment would be, that you'd be ignored by your father. I mean, that, this is not an appropriate response under any set of circumstances. And all it's accomplishing in this case is driving a wedge between the relationship that he has with his son. James tells us in James 2.13, for judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over justice. So, Initially, David was unwilling to hold Absalom accountable at all, not according to the law's requirements, but on the other hand, now he's neither willing to extend mercy to his son. And all he's done is hold him in limbo. He sits in this no man's land between adjudication and forgiveness. 
And so at that point, after two years, Absalom decides he's going to take matters into his own hands. He begins a pattern of behavior that suggests he's had enough of his father's cold shoulder and he's going to chart his own course. It starts in verse 29. Then Absalom sent for Joab and send, to send him to the king, but Joab would not come to him. So he sent again a second time. He would not come. Therefore he sent, he said to his servants, you see Joab's field is next to mine and he has barley there. Go set it on fire. So Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Then Joab arose, came to Absalom at his house and said to him, why have your servants set my field on fire? Absalom answered Joab, behold, I sent for you saying, come here that I may send you to the king to say, why have I come from Geshur? It would be better for me still to be there. Now, therefore, let me see the king's face. And if there is iniquity in me, let him put me to death. So when Joab came to the king and told him, he called for Absalom. Thus, he came to the king and prostrated himself on the, his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. So Absalom wants answers. Why am I still being banished? You know, it'd be better if I just stayed where I was. Why did he call me down here as if to say you're free from condemnation, I forgive you, and then he just sticks me outside his presence. So he's looking for a way to break that log jam, and he calls for the commander of the army, Joab. Remember, Joab was the one who convinced David to bring Absalom back from Geshur in the first place. So it makes sense, logically, that David would think this is the same guy who can broker a peace between me and David. After all, he's the one who said David wanted me down here. But when he initially calls Joab, Joab ignores the request twice. Now the text doesn't tell us why Joab did that. But if you were to go to 1 Kings, in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 28, 228 of 1 Kings, you learn that Joab had aligned himself later behind another of David's sons, behind Adonijah. Adonijah is the, the next born after Absalom. And when Absalom's gone, that's not giving away too much, I hope, for you guys. But when Absalom's gone, then it will become Adonijah's turn to try to take the throne from David. When that happens, Joab aligns with Adonijah against David. So reading between the lines... If Joab has looked at the succession and decided Adonijah is his man, then Absalom is not. Remember, we know the Lord selected Solomon to succeed David. And David knew that. Presumably Bathsheba knew that. We know Solomon probably knew that. Solomon is the Lord's choice. But it is not clear that David has told anyone else this. That is... No one knows that Solomon is the one who's going to be the, throne, uh, the heir to the throne. And least of all, Solomon's brothers, the other sons of David. In fact, it's probably likely David has kept that news from them precisely because that would mean that young Solomon would be the target of his older brother's murderous ambitions. If they knew that he was the one supposed to get the tr throne, they'd all be after him. So as David ages, everyone in David's court is playing this guessing game. Which one of his sons is going to end up succeeding him? And they begin to throw their support behind various actors. Before they, they kind of put their money on whoever they think is likely to be that successor so that they can begin to ingratiate themselves with that person and be in good position when they finally take the throne. Now, ordinarily, David's third-born son, his oldest surviving son right now, Absalom, he would normally have been the betting choice. He's the logical one to succeed. In man's ways of thinking, the oldest would get it. But the strife between Absalom and David, these two years of the two not talking to each other, well, that's, put, that's cast doubt on the whole plan. No one's quite sure whether David's going to give the throne to Absalom or not under those circumstances. So it would appear that at some point in all of that, Joab has decided for himself that his money is, in, is on Adonijah not on Absalom, probably because of this intractable dispute. And so here's Absalom calling for Joab to help broker a peace, and now that's against Joab's best interests. He, he'd rather see that dispute continue because it puts his man in a better position. But Absalom forces Joab's hand at that point. He puts the servants to a task. He says, go light his field on fire. That'll get his attention. 
It's, and, and once Joab hears of it, he realizes, I can't ignore this guy forever. He's going to be a nuisance. He's going to continue to do these kinds of things. I can't act against the, the, the king's own son. So I'm going to have to deal with him. And so he goes to him and Absalom says, I want an audience with my father. I want to get in front of this guy, in front of my dad and find out what the problem is and see why he's held me outside his counsel for so long. And then ironically, I don't hope you notice the irony in this. Ironically, Absalom challenges Joab saying, I'll tell David if he finds any fault in me at all, he can kill me. Of course, he says that on the heels of having just committed arson against Joab's property, right? Of course, he's speaking specifically about the murder of, of Amnon, but it goes to show you he has no self-awareness here. He, he does not see himself as guilty of anything deserving punishment, and so he wants to be put back in the good graces of David. And in some sense, he has a valid point. That is, David should either hold Absalom accountable according to the law, which would be death in this case, or else he should extend Absalom mercy and put an end to his exile. There's really no case to be made for the situation that David has put Absalom in. So Joab tells David what Absalom says. David invites an audience with Absalom. When the son arrives, he bows to David, prostrate, throwing himself on David's mercy. And in response, David embraces his son and they are reconciled. Now, you might suppose that this would put an end to the conflict in their relationship, but the damage was already done. What had been done is now uh, irreconcilable. If anything, David's willingness to capitulate to Absalom right now only emboldens Absalom to pursue greater objectives against his father. With, with Absalom out of the doghouse now, he's ready to embark on a public campaign to cement his position as David's heir apparent. And that starts in verse 1 of chapter 15. Now it came about after this that Absalom provided for himself a chariot and horses and 50 men as runners before him. Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way to the gate. And when any man had a suit to come to the king for judgment, Absalom would call to him and say, from what city are you? And he would say, your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. And then Absalom would say to him, well, see, your, your claims are good and right, but no man listens to you on the part of the king. Moreover, Absalom would say, oh, that one would appoint me judge in the land. Well, then every man who has any suit or cause could come to me and I would give him justice. And when a man came near to prostrate himself before him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom dealt with all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole away the hearts of the men of Israel. Sounds like a politician, doesn't he? So his antics involve these public displays of power and royal privilege. It's all calculated, of course. First, he, he wants to project the status of king. And he does that by securing a chariot as the son of a king. He had access to this stuff from the palace. So he gets a chariot pulled by some number of stallions. And then he proceeds to have 50 men running ahead of him wherever he goes in his chariot. Now you wonder where did that come from? Well, ever since the prophet Samuel, uh, that had been the proper way for kings to make an entrance in Israel. Because when Israel first demanded a king from the prophet, Samuel warned them in advance. You're not gonna like how this goes. He told them, the king is gonna be a burden to you. In 1 Samuel 8.10, he said, this is what you read. Samuel spoke all the words of the Lord to the people who had asked of him a king. He said, this will be the procedure of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons. He'll place them for himself in his chariots among his horsemen, and they'll run before his chariots. He'll appoint for himself commanders of thousands and of fifties, and some to do his plowing and to reap his harvest and to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He'll also take your daughters for perfumers and cooks and bakers, He'll take the best of your fields and your vineyards and your olive groves and give them to his servants. It goes on from there, right? Again, this is what we're used to with politicians, right? And a king was the, the utmost of a politician. He could have anything he wants. And Samuel just tells the people straight up, this is how kings behave. This is what they do. And you want that? You want these people taking all the best from you and serving you or, or uh, uh, taking advantage of you in that way? You really want to invite that? Now, here's the irony. Israel heard that warning, and they did not understand it. They heard it in a completely opposite way. They heard Samuel's words as a prescription, not as a description. That is, they thought they were being told how a king should be. 
And so they made this a prescription for kings. Ever since that time, kings made sure men always ran in front of their chariot. Why? Because Samuel said that's what would happen. Ironic, right? He was telling them that as a evidence of excess, and they took it as a prescription for how to live. And Absalom repeats that here. In fact, that's what you can see. Clearly, he's taking the, the playbook of a king, and he's applying it to himself for the very effect of showing himself as a king, potentially, before the people. That's the whole idea here. He wants them to see him as a king in waiting. So he takes on the status of king. Secondly, we're told he projects the wisdom and the authority of a king. He does that by rendering judgment for people in the gate of the city while undermining David's authority. Now, you know probably that gates uh, in a city wall were multi-chambered spaces, very deep spaces, and they had room then for people to gather. That's where official business was traditionally kept or conducted in the gate. Well, the reason for that, of course, is if you want to secure the city and you don't want foreigners walking all the way into your city, you just let them in the first part of the gate. You do business with them there, and then they go back out. They never get into the whole city that way. So it was a tradition. Sitting in the gate is a biblical way of saying doing the city business, working as a magistrate or a judge or something of that sort. And so if someone sat in the gate, they were representing the king's government. They were part of the king's administration. In verse two, we're told that Absalom took on this practice of rising early, probably to make sure he got out there before anybody else. And he, he got out on a road leading into the gate. He couldn't operate in the gate. No one would have let him do it. He wasn't an official magistrate, but he, he kind of gets ahead of them by going out to the city roads that led into the gate where he could intercept those people who were coming on that day to do business. And it says he would catch the attention of someone walking in. He'd say, where are you coming from? He'd engage in a conversation. When he found out they were from one of the tribes of Israel, that is, they were Jews, then he would take opportunity to ingratiate himself to that Jew. He would encourage the traveler first by saying, what are you here for? He'd hear the man's suit and he'd say, oh, you've got a valid claim. You definitely should have that come your way. But then just as quickly, he would say, you know, it's a shame that the king is never gonna hear you. He's never gonna do what you want. He won't even give you the time of day. And then of course he adds, if only I were judge, you'd get everything you want, a chicken in every pot. And Abs as an old reference to politics, if anybody gets it, they're over the age of 50. Absalom engages in this charade, it says, on a continuing basis, every day, he's building up a, uh, a base of support within the population of Israel. And remember, the, the people of Israel would go to this gate periodically out of necessity. Even if you didn't go this year or next year, you went eventually. And so if he stayed there long enough, he'd see almost everybody, at least anyone who had any say-so in business. And he engages in this charade to undermine the people's confidence in David and to build himself up in their eyes. In verse six, we're told that in this way, he steals away the hearts of the men of Israel. And that's the third way in which he tried to put himself in a position of advantage. He not only uh, looked to have the status of a king but the wisdom of the, and the authority of a king, but then also to have the devotion of the people for their king. And he did that by that that whole episode of uh, kissing the hand of somebody or showing this affected interest in them, which wasn't really true at all. It was entirely an act. Orchestrated campaign. The idea is this. The people will demand that Absalom fo uh, uh, follow his father as king. And should David try to appoint someone else, should that be the case, it won't work because the people will throw their backing behind Absalom and demand him despite David. That's the idea. Now, where is David while all this is going on? This goes on for years. Where's David? Why doesn't he put a stop to all of this? Well, first, he continues in his unwillingness to confront his sons, much less control them. And that's just a continuation of his poor family leadership. Once he reconciled with Absalom, it's as if David appears to have just said, oh, well, never mind him now. I don't have to worry about him anymore and puts him right back out of his mind. Later in 1 Kings, you hear that David refuses at another point in time to stop the third son, Adonijah, when that son tries to take the throne by force in a kind of similar way to Absalom. In 1 Kings 1, 5, we hear this. Now, Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself saying, I will be king. 
So he prepared, listen to this, he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen with 50 men to run before him. Sound familiar? Verse six, his father had never crossed him at any time by asking, why have you done so? And he was, and Adonijah was also a very handsome man and was born after Absalom. I bring up that example just to say, David is not doing differently by Adonijah than he does by Absalom. It's the same problem both times. These sons are doing things calculated to try to take control and David's doing nothing to stop it when he should. This is the basic failing of this section of the book. David not able to handle the authority of being father over these sons. That's the first reason, but there's another reason. We know historically what David was doing around this time when Adonijah, or sorry, when uh, Absalom is engaged in all of this campaigning. This is the same point in time when David was apparently distracted by various projects which he was engaged in, which left him oblivious to what was going on or disinterested at least, because during the same time David was building his palace, he was building a new place for the ark, he was contemplating a temple for God and probably preparing it, if nothing else, looking for the land that it would be based on. And you know, you think about it, a lot of long lasting regimes, power structures that are in place for many years, many of those go badly toward the end, right? They lose interest over time in doing what's necessary to make lives better, to make things better for the people. They become very self-absorbed. It's all about legacy and privilege and maintaining power. It's a very classic human nature kind of thing. We're all about the populist needs when we get elected and then 10 years into power, we couldn't care less about the people anymore. It's about you know, the champagne and the opportunity to hold on to power. And David's inward focus at this stage of his time as king has ensured that Absalom's suggestion that David doesn't care about you, the king will never listen to your complaints, you'll never get justice from the king. Well, those were, may have been slanderous comments, but they may have also found a receptive audience because there was a grain of truth in them to the point where Absalom finally decides he can just make a move against his father. He can take the throne and have to wait for David to die. And David didn't see it coming. Verse seven. Now it came about at the end of 40 years that Absalom said to the king, please let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed to the Lord in Hebron. For your servant vowed a vow while I was living in Geshur and Aram saying, if the Lord shall indeed bring me back to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. The king said to him, go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron. But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel saying, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom is king in Hebron. Then 200 men went with Absalom from Jerusalem who were invited and went innocently and they did not know anything. And Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gilanite, David's counselor from his city, Gihalo while he was offering the sacrifices. And the conspiracy was strong for the people increased continually with Absalom. So Absalom's done campaigning. It's time to collect on all of that investment. So in verse seven, we're told that at the end of 40 years, Absalom approaches David with a request. But that length of time there does not make sense. It doesn't fit the context at all. The contextual clues in the story would suggest that the time was not 40 years, it was four four years. And it's likely that the value here was changed from four to 40 as a result of a copyist's error at some point in history. Now, if you remember a few months back, weeks back, whenever it was, I mentioned to you that both first and second Samuel are known for having the most copyist errors of any books in the whole Bible. There's something about the way these books move through history. But for the same reason that I can say that, that is, we know of the errors, we can also know what it should have been because we have cross-references, largely in 1 Kings, 2 Kings, but also in uh, other books uh, of scripture and other works of history. In fact, Josephus' account of this same story says four years. And the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is an ancient manuscript of scripture, it also says four years. So four fits the context. It, it, 40 does not, and we do have evidence that it should have been four in the first place. Here again, this does not indict scripture, quite to the contrary. The fact that I can know of the error and know what the correct value is gives me added confidence to know I'm not gonna be fooled by data that's wrong in scripture. I'm gonna find the answer. God's gonna make sure of that. But still, four years is a long time. Four years of Absalom sitting in the gate. Four years of Absalom telling lies about David. 
and of trying to find his allies here. And there are four years of him running around with a chariot with 50 men everywhere. This is a guy who has made a patient, calculated effort to build a base of support for the very day now that he takes the next step. He tells David on this day, I'm gonna have to go to Hebron because I made a vow while I was in Geshur. Now, the vow he made, he says, was when he was back in Geshur, he didn't know he'd come back to Jerusalem. He didn't know what his future held. He vowed to God, if you just let me go back to Jerusalem, I will go serve you or I'll worship you, in other words. And now that he's back in Jerusalem, he says, I gotta fulfill my vow. I gotta go to Hebron. Now, why Hebron? Well, probably because that's where the tabernacle was still located at this point in history. And so you'd have to go there to worship in a very specific sense. But knowing Absalom's plans and knowing his motives, there is absolutely no reason to think he's telling the truth about any of this. There's probably no vow. He never made a vow. He doesn't have to go fulfill a vow. He's using this story as a cover, as an excuse to go to Hebron. He can say he's going for this reason and it seems reasonable, but the real answer is he wants to travel to Hebron because that's where he wants to coronate himself as king. That's where he wants to be when he announces himself as David's replacement. Why Hebron? Well, three reasons. First, it was the place of David's anointing. So there's a, a tremendous symbolism associated with gaining power as the king in the place that the prior king gained it in Hebron. Secondly, Hebron is a relatively safe distance from Jerusalem, which would give uh, Absalom the space and the time to uh, prepare his, uh, his forces, organize for an attack. If he tried to take command in Jerusalem, he could quickly lose control of the situation with David's forces so close. And then finally, this is his hometown. Absalom was born here in Hebron. And the assumption is that they're friendly to him for that reason, but also they're not quite so enamored with David because David took the capital away from Hebron and put it in a Canaanite city, Jerusalem. And that probably did not sit well with the folks of Hebron. It was a bit of a diminishment of that town. So all of that plays to Absalom's advantage. He's gonna have a friendly local crowd when he makes his announcement. Kind of the same reason why you see politicians go back to their home state or their home city whenever they make their announcement, right? They wanna be among friends. So he goes back uh, under the, the guise of going to fulfill a vow, but it's all a fake, it's all a lie. And he arranges to have 200 military men of David's court attend with him, go back with him, probably just as protection or part of his entourage, whatever. And it says here, the soldiers do not know what Absalom has planned. They go innocently. And this is the idea. The idea is to force them to side with Absalom by putting them in a no-win situation. Once they learn of Absalom's rebellion, when they're already in Hebron, separated from David, by that point, it's gonna be impossible for them to oppose Absalom without dying. They're gonna be forced into the moment to say, are you with me or not? And if they say no, they got no one to protect them. They're out in the middle of nowhere. So they're gonna feel very pressured to align with Absalom at that point. And so what that assures Absalom is that as he gets ready to start civil war, he's gonna have a strong personal guard. He's gonna have the appearance of the army's support and all that plays to his advantage. Finally, he calls for Ahithophel, the man that you hear there at the end, a Gilanite, David's counselor. He calls for him to come from David's court, travel down and join him in Hebron. Now that man is the grandfather of Bathsheba. We find that out in 2 Samuel 11 and 2 Samuel 23. So he is a family member, the grandfather of, of Bathsheba, and he's been a counselor to David in his court, and now he's going to leave the court, travel to Hebron, and align himself with Absalom. This shows you how high in the ranks the conspiracy has taken itself. Now, it's to the point where chief counselors of David are aligned with his enemy. In fact, verse 12, we hear that. The conspiracy is so strong, leading you to wonder, well, how can David stop it at this point? Yeah, Solomon's the true heir, but he's 14 years old right now. <laughs> he's hardly in a position to take control of the throne. David's still alive, but David's older. You know, he's not the young guy that threw you know, stones at Goliath. He's a much older man now. He's unlikely to be waging much battle on his own. And so given the, his situation, his son's situation with Solomon and the fact that he's got high-ranking cabinet members falling out, the suggestion here is David's losing his grip on power. It's pretty dire. And so when the news reaches David that Absalom's preparing himself as king, he realizes the precarious situation he's in. In verse 13, we hear this. Then a messenger came to David saying, 
The hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, will arise, let us flee. For otherwise none of us will escape from Absalom. Go in haste or he will overtake us quickly and bring down calamity on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. Then the king's servant said to the king, behold, your servants are ready to do whatever my Lord, the king chooses. So the king went out and all his household with him. But the king left 10 concubines to keep the house. The Lord went out and all the people with him and they stopped at the last house. And now all his servants passed on beside him. All the Cherethites, all the Pelethites, all the Gittites, 600 men who had come with him from Gath passed on before the king. So David hears what his son's, what his son has done and, and the people are all in his side and he realizes he has no choice. He has to leave Jerusalem. David was a pretty pragmatic guy. He always had been. He looked at his situation pretty realistically. He wasn't um, one of these dreamers who always assumed he could win. He was, if anything, a bit pessimistic. And he knew that his son's popularity meant he didn't have a lot of allies and he couldn't be sure even who they were. And so he decides he'd rather leave and bide his time and wait for the right opportunity than risk a war. And then, of course, the concern he has about the edge of the sword is concern here is that the city he built and loves is going to be torn apart if he stays there. So for the love of the city and for a better opportunity later, he decides the best course of action is to simply retreat for now. You know, he's not going to take Absalom's bait. Absalom is baiting him here. Absalom has set this up so that David would feel some need to defend his territory without the necessary support, and he gets slaughtered. David's smarter than that. So he tells the servants, we're going to leave the city quickly. We're going to live to fight another day. And after all, you know, if, if a messenger could come from Hebron and tell David Absalom's coming, well, Absalom can come just as fast as that messenger did. He's probably not far behind. So David says, we've got to move quick. As David leaves the city to the east... He's followed by a troop of more than 600 men. I mean, we hear about the Cherethites, the Pelethites. Those were the men of Philistine descent who were David's non-Jewish paid bodyguards. Remember, he hired non-Jews. He hired Gentiles because they weren't going to be likely to be persuaded to go with any other family member. They, they had no allegiance to any Jew. They don't care. They just went with whoever paid them. David was paying them. And he also had 600 men from Gath. Now, Gath was part of Israel, but... Gath was also a Philistine city, and they were likely mercenary soldiers who were loyal to David for the same reason. They were employed. So given that David's own son is in rebellion to him, the only men that David seems to trust at this point are Gentiles that he's paying. And the text doesn't mention Solomon, but given his young age, I think it's safe to assume he's with his dad. He's following with his dad in all of this. He's not going to be left behind because, again, he'd be... Uh, target number one for Absalom. And so as David reaches the last house in Jerusalem during his ex exit, he sends all the other men ahead and he stops for a moment. He wants to challenge one resident of the city who's starting to follow him. Verse 19, then the king said to Ittai the Gittite, why will you also go with us? Return and remain with the king for you are a foreigner and also an exile. Return to your own place. You came only yesterday. And shall I today make you wander with us while I go where I will? Return and take back your brothers. Mercy and truth be with you. But Atai answered the king and said, As the Lord lives, as my Lord the king lives, surely whatever my Lord the king may be, uh, wherever may be, whether for death or for life, there also your servant will be. Therefore David said to Atai, Go and pass over. So Atai the Gittai passed over with all his men and all the little ones who were with him. While all the country was weeping with a loud voice, all the people passed over. The king also passed over the brook Kidron, and all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness. It's kind of a little moment here. David notices one man, a Thai, a Gittite from the town of Gath, and he's following. Now, this man is noticeable because he's not one of the paid ones. <laughs> he's not one of the ones David's hired. So David asks this guy, why, why are you following me? You're a foreigner. You're an exile. He's not Jewish either. He's a Gentile also. And it says, you came only yesterday. Now, it could be literal. That is, this man could literally have been the one who brought the news to David of Absalom's coup. Maybe that's how David knew of him. Maybe that's why David wondered why he's following. Or it could be a little bit more euphemistic. You just came recently. Uh, I know you haven't been here that long. 
so to speak. In either case, he's telling him, you know, this is not a fight you need to be involved in. It's not between you and us. It's between me and my son. You won't be involved. Just stay here. There's no reason for yourself you know, to get aligned with me and get into trouble. But Atai responds saying, wherever you go, I will be. For as the king lives, I am with you, pledging his allegiance to David. And so David says, well, then you're welcome. Go on ahead. And he says, he passes on. Now the passing here is through the Valley Kidron. Again, the Kidron Valley is the eastern valley that borders the old city today. You call it the old city of Jerusalem. At that time, it was the only city of Jerusalem. The walls that, um, if you've ever seen pictures, I should have brought one, I didn't think about it, but there's that famous scene as you look down that valley from the old city of Jerusalem today, that high wall leading into a valley of olive trees up the Garden of Gethsemane and then into the, hill, the Mount of Olives on the other side. That's the path that David took here, kind of the opposite one of what Jesus took on the donkey on Palm Sunday leaving the city that way. And as he gets to the last house, there were some people who lived outside the walls. And as he gets to the last house, before he passes over the brook of Kidron, that's where he has this conversation. It says he's gonna go over that brook, up the mountain of olives, and onto the wilderness. That is a place David knew well. The wilderness is this area of treeless desert that, he, that starts almost immediately after you cross over the Mount of Olives. Just a few hills later, you're in this wilderness area. If you've ever uh, been to somewhere like uh, California where on the coast it's lush and then you cross the mountains and all of a sudden it's Death Valley. That's the same exact geography of Israel. The winds blow the same direction. Uh, Israel is the size of New Jersey, but it's just like California. It's like a miniature California the size of New Jersey. You can ski in the morning and be on the beach in the afternoon. You, you cross from lush you know, landscape over a mountain and all of a sudden it looks like you're in Death Valley. So that's what David used to spend his time in when he was fleeing from Saul. He knows that area really well. And he's gonna go back there again. Uh, the last time he was there, he was retreating from a foe who thought he wanted control of a throne that David wasn't trying to take. And now David's in the middle of a fight that didn't have to happen because he invited his son to take the throne, in effect, by giving him the kind of treatment that he did and not standing up to him in a stronger way. So finally, David, as he leaves the city, has one more encounter. The priest, a couple of priests come out, loyal to David, bringing the ark, assuming that they should follow David if he's leaving. Verse 24. Now behold, Zadok also came and all the Levites with him carrying the ark of the covenant of God. And they sat down the ark of God and Abiathar came up until all the people had finished passing from the city. The king said to Zadok, return the ark of God to the city. If I find favor in the sight of the Lord, then he'll bring me back again and show me both it and his habitation. But if he should say thus, I have no delight in you. Behold, here I am. Let him do to me as he seems good. It seems good as seems good to him. All right, so we're gonna put a couple slides up here. Uh, this is a reminder slide of who we're dealing with. Absalom, uh, Amnon is gone, Chileab, the second born we never hear of, he's gone. So Absalom now is the one who's next in line. After him, you have Adonijah, and then a few, a few others all the way down to Solomon, who is seventh born. This is the distance between Jerusalem and Hebron, not that far as it looks on the map, it's not really that far at all. It's probably less than a day's walk. And Zadok now comes out, one of two men who are priests in this time, along with the man Abiathar. Now, we need to look a little bit at who this man Abiathar is because this moment has some significance in that man's life. If you remember the priest who was in place as high priest, when Samuel was the young boy dropped off by his mom to serve the Lord, committed to serving the Lord. The priest at that time was a man named Eli. And you hear that in the beginning of 1 Samuel. So Eli on the right there, he descends from Ethamar and from Aaron's line generally. And Eli was a poor father. That's the story of 1 Samuel. He raises two evil, ungodly sons who by their ungodliness anger God to the point 
that the Lord tells Eli through Samuel that his family is going to be removed from serving as priest in Israel. And in their place, the Lord said he's gonna raise up a new family of priests who would obey the Lord and do what's proper. And this is what he says in 1 Samuel 2, 31. He says, behold, the days are coming when I will break your strength and the strength of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your house. You will see the distress of my dwelling in spite of all the good that I do for Israel and an old man will not be in your house forever. Yet I will not cut off every man of yours from my altar so that your eyes will fail from weeping and your soul grieve and all the increase of your house will die in the prime of life. This will be the sign to you which will come concerning your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. On the same day, both of them will die. But I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is my heart and in my soul. And I will build him an enduring house and he will walk before my anointed always. So here's what the Lord said to Eli. He said, in the day to come, uh, he was going to make sure that Eli's family of priests would end and in their place, a new family would take over. All of them still coming from Aaron, as God required. But in other words, a new branch would pick up the torch of serving in the family of priests. Now, Abi, uh, Ab, I'm sorry, Abiathar, you see him on the bottom right there. He is the priest of this moment we're in now in 2 Samuel. He is a descendant of Eli. He's among this family that God just said can't have it forever. And that God would one day deal with that family. Obviously, it was a lot later than Eli. God waited a few generations, but he's ready now to, to fulfill that promise. And it comes about because in a future day, slightly further in history from where we are right now in 2 Samuel, there's coming a day in which Abiathar is going to align himself with Adonijah, the next son after Absalom. And as a result of that rebellion against David, David is going to order that Abiathar die after David is dead. Solomon will carry out that request. And in that day, in that future day, Zadok will take Abiathar's place as high priest. You see where Zadok comes from. And so that's where the line shifts from Abiathar to Zadok. Little nugget for you. In the kingdom, the thousand year reign of Christ on earth, in the millennial temple that we will have there, where there will again be a priesthood active, actively performing sacrifice again, the priests that perform that are all sons of Zadok, we're told. So Zadok's sons will be those, resurrected sons will be those who come in and serve in that role. That's how significant this shift is in God's economy. So here you see Zadok's loyalty and his godliness at work in his decision to follow David out of the city rather than to stay in the city and take whoever the next king may be. And you should notice in the text, it was Zadok's initiative to do what we see happening here. You notice it says Zadok brings the ark, brought, uh, accompanied by all the priests, and then only at the end there does it say Abiathar comes out as well. Almost as if to suggest Abiathar felt no choice at that point. Everyone else was gonna go, I guess I better go too. So he's not in this in any way except just to cover himself. David is, if you notice, doesn't address Abiathar here. He only addresses Zadok. And he tells Zadok, no, I don't want you to bring the ark out. I want you to keep it here, stay here with the priests, stay where God has placed you. God doesn't want David in the city right now, and David is willing to accept that judgment as a deserving judgment. But God has not said anything about the priests, and he's not said anything about the ark. So David says, if God wants to bring me back, he will. And then when I do come back, I'll have the ark, I'll have everything. It'll be waiting here for me. But he also recognizes this is discipline and I don't know how far it's gonna go. I don't know where God's taking this. It might be in God's plan that I don't come back. In which case, this thing's not supposed to follow me. We're supposed to follow it. It stays here. And so David accepts the discipline of the Lord here as medicine he deserves and not a sign that God is intending to move the ark or to move the priesthood. And verse 27, the king said also to Zadok the priest, are you not a seer? Return to the city in peace with your two sons with you, your son Ahamahaza and Jonathan, the son of Abiathar. See, I'm going to wait at the fords of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. Therefore, Zadok and Abiathar returned the ark of God to Jerusalem and remained there. And David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives and wept as he went and his head was covered and he walked barefoot. 
Then all the people who were with him each covered his head and wept as they went. So David tells them, go home. They do. Then he goes up the Mount of Olives weeping, showing a kind of status of mourning, barefoot and the like. What is David feeling right now? I would submit he's feeling what the writer of Hebrews says you feel when you face the discipline of the Lord. In Hebrews 12, 11, the writer says, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful. Kind of an understatement, wouldn't you agree? It seems not to be joyful. It's definitely not joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. David must have known that he was reaping what he sowed in this moment with his sons. It didn't make it any easier. I'm not saying that it made it fun, of course, but his faith in the goodness of God gave him the courage to face what God brought to him at this point. And he learns his lessons quickly. Remember, that's one of the high points of David's character. He messes up like we all do, but he gets disciplined and he repents quickly and he recognizes his mistake quickly. You wanna see how quickly he faces his mistake. Look at the next series of verses. Verse 31, now someone told David saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, oh Lord, I pray, make the counsel of Ahithophel foolish. Now, why is that significant? Well, it's at this moment that David hears that his wife's grandfather has joined the rebellion to give counsel to Absalom. Now that's a dangerous move for David. This is a guy who's had access to David's inner counsel. He knows David's military plans. He knows his strength. He kind of knows everything. And that's gonna be now in the hands of Absalom. Now, ordinarily, this would only make things worse, but look what David does with this news. He goes immediately to prayer. It's a brief moment, but it's important. When is the last time you saw David pray in the text? The last time we have recorded David praying is when his son was dying. And what have we seen before? This is a man who prayed off and on for 10 years in the desert, wrote the Psalms. I mean, this is a man who made prayer the hallmark of his, of his time early in life appealing to God. Should I fight here? Should I fight there? Should I go up? Should I not go up? And you know, should I fight Goliath or not? And he has gotten away from that. And true to form, when David faces difficult odds, he quickly remembers to lean on the Lord and not on himself. So he prays to the Lord here that the man's counsel would be made foolish so that it would actually undermine Absalom. That's the best side of David. Always comes out under pressure. This moment would suggest to me anyway, that the discipline of the Lord as David marches up that hill has already started to change his attitude a little bit. And as he gets to the top of the hill, he's reminded of what he has to do when he's not in control. He's never really in control. The, God, the Lord's gonna have to win this battle. He knows it. And he's been waiting for David to remember it. And so David prays, worshiping on the mount, and the Lord brings a moment of encouragement to follow. Verse 32. It happened as David was coming to the summit where God was worshiped, that behold, Hushai, uh, Hushai, the archite, met him with his coat torn and dust on his head. And David said to him, if you pass over with me, then you will be a burden to me. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I have been your father's servant in times past. So I will now be your servant. Then you can thwart the counsel of Ahithophel for me. Are not Zadok and Abiathar the priests with you there? So it shall be that whatever you hear from the king's house, you shall report to Zadok and Abiathar the priests. Behold, their two sons are with them there, Ahimaaz and Zadok's son and Jonathan, Abiathar's son. And by them you shall send me everything that you hear. So Hushai, David's friend, came into the city and Absalom came into Jerusalem. All right, so a messenger named Hushai comes to David, probably to tell David of what he already knew, that Absalom was coming. And David sees opportunity and he says to this guy, if you come with me, I gotta feed you. That's not helping. But if you go back to the city and you tell the king that you're on his side, you can become my spy. Pledge yourself to him as, your, as his servant. By the way, that's a very believable lie because everyone else was doing the same thing already. So it's just another man throwing his support behind Absalom. But in that position, he can undermine the counsel of Ahithophel. Uh, he can report back to David. He can be a spy in all those good ways that would help David. And he says, you're not gonna do it alone. You got priests there who are also on my side. They'll help you get the news in and out. They'll help you in this process. This is David's first big break. Look at the order of things here. David walking up a hill, showing a mournful, repentant attitude. David praying to the Lord when he faces the 
the trial of knowing he's lost his counselor, and the next moment, David sees the Lord respond, giving him this advantage and a sense of encouragement, a little hope. So the thing David was most known for, he slipped away from for a while, and now the times are difficult. David has come back to that, that strength, prayer, dependence on the Lord, and right away he sees the Lord respond in encouragement. I've seen this pattern in my own life. You, you move away from what you know you should do, you get a little correction, move back quick, take the correction, take the discipline, do the right thing, and watch what the Lord does. He, he delights, I think, to encourage us with a little win, a little, bit of, a little bit of success, something that tells you, yes, okay, I got the point, now we're back on track, and then it moves from there. Last thing I wanna bring up tonight, as you see David fleeing here, there's a powerful picture being built in this story that's easy to overlook. It actually builds out over several chapters, starting here. It's a picture of Christ. Now, we all know David is a picture of Jesus in the scriptures. That's no surprise. But this scene and what follows from it is one of the more powerful pictures in David's life. David's flight from the city pictures Jesus' departure from Jerusalem after his first coming. First, remember how his first coming ended. Shouldn't be news for anybody in here. He entered the city of Jerusalem for that last week of his life. At first, as he comes into the city, he's received like a rock star. He's got people on the road saying, Hosanna in the highest. Here's the king coming into his kingdom. Effectively, in his beginnings of that week, Jesus is received with joy by most, if not all, of the city as king. But before that week is over, he's rejected by Israel as their Messiah, and they're calling for him to be crucified. Ultimately, he's led out of the city, and he's crucified for the sins of the world. Three days later, he resurrects. He spends some time with the disciples, as you remember, before ascending to the right hand of the Father. This story of David's flight from Jerusalem is a picture of that story of Jesus in the broad strokes. First, we know David was initially welcomed into the city by Israel, joyfully as their king. And he received that in the beginning, and after a period of time, they turn against him. And at this point, he has so few allies in the city, he has to escape as if he were an enemy of the Jewish people, leaving the city with no Jewish support at all. And yet, David is still the rightful king, just as Jesus was. He's no less king because he's not winning the popular vote. He's just a king rejected. That was Jesus' example or Jesus' situation as his first coming came to an end. Rejected by the people he came to be king for, prevented from ascending to the throne and ruling as he intended to do by their rejection and dying, resurrecting, of course, as part of the plan of redemption. But even after he resurrected, he couldn't stay in the city. He had to escape the city. He had to leave. He couldn't reign. He had to go. He left waiting for a future time in which he would come back and he would reign over Israel. And notice further the parallels between how David exits Jerusalem and how Jesus exited the city in his day. David, we already learned, he goes eastward. He goes out, down the Kidron Valley, up the Mount of Olives. Similarly, that's exactly how Jesus left the city for the last time. In the book of Acts chapter one, we hear this, verse four. Gathering the disciples together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you've heard of from me. And after he said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they gazed intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And they also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking in the sky? This Jesus, who's been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. So where were they when Jesus departs, they were on the Mount of Olives. So if he spoke to them while they were in Jerusalem and then he departs from them from the Mount of Olives, then connecting the dots, they moved together with him out the city, down the Kidron Valley, up the Mount of Olives before he finally left them as he ascended. The same way David left, Jesus left as he departs the city after his death or after his uh, resurrection. Then consider who was supporting David as he left. Apart from a few Jewish allies, the priests primarily, David only had Gentile support as he left the city. Chief among them was a man of Gath who pledged that he would go wherever the Lord went, right? He would devote his life to following David and doing what David commanded. 
And likewise, when Jesus left Jerusalem in the years that followed, he had a Gentile, largely Gentile following, not a Jewish following as the church has gone. And what do our Gentile followers of Jesus do today and ever always have done? We pledge ourselves that as long as the Lord lives, we devote ourselves to following him anywhere and doing as he commands. We're like the man of Gath. And as David left, the priests came up and they said, should we go with you? And should we bring the ark with you? And David said, no, my departure from the city does not mean the removal of God's presence or his seat of mercy from the people. And in fact, the priesthood and the mercy seat of the Lord were supposed to remain behind even as the king left on his own. And similarly, as Jesus, our king, and I should add our high priest, departs earth, he also commands that the priesthood and the mercy of God remain behind. The priesthood of the believer, the church, we are the priests of God according to scripture. We remain on earth even as he is gone. We all still serve as intercessors. We're rec- we're, our job is to reconcile humanity to God. We're intercessors in that sense. And we possess the gospel, which we proclaim. God's mercy, his forgiveness to everyone who comes to him in faith. That is the mercy seat of God today. It's still available to those who hear the message. So although the king is gone for a time, The Father has required that the presence of God in the church and in the story, the message of the gospel, would stay behind. We're not supposed to go with Jesus yet. We're supposed to stay here in what we're being told to do. And then lastly, David saw the opportunity to direct the affairs of the city in his absence by means of a hidden messenger who would be sent back to do his bidding. That messenger would work with the priests and their sons to do the king's business, to prepare for the king's return to power in a day to come. And likewise, we too have been given a hidden messenger, the Holy Spirit, who works with the priests of God to do the bidding of the king, to exchange information, that we would get direction from the king by means of this messenger, and that we would send our requests back to the king by means of this messenger as well. We pray through the Spirit and put our petitions before the king. Look, that picture is just starting. All the way through the next series of chapters, we're gonna see it all build. And in fact, this picture doesn't just focus on the first coming of Christ, it is the full circle. Before it's over, we will see it picturing the return of Christ at his second coming. So this story of David leaving the city and coming back into the city becomes opportunity for God to tell a story of what he will do through his son in the redemption of mankind. Can you not already sit back a little and look at this in awe as God writes history in such a way that it will tell a larger story of future events? And so he's giving added meaning to what is taking place in David's life. So David acted foolishly, precipitating all of these outcomes and receiving the consequences of his behavior. But God is using the whole set of circumstances to paint a picture of the plan of redemption, which only goes to show you how powerful God is. You know he causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. But you need to appreciate what that means. It doesn't just mean he can fix your mess. It doesn't just mean he can use your mess to yield some benefit for you. I mean, he can do all that, yeah, but that's not half of it. He is so powerful and wise, he can design your messes so that they fulfill the plan of God and glorify Christ in the process. David's conflict with his sons was was a gigantic mess. And in the midst of that pain and turmoil, it becomes this beautiful proclamation of Jesus in all that he does in redemption. What story of glory is God proclaiming through your messes? And you may not know the answer to that. We often don't. But you know he can do it. And if so, you need to play your part well in your own little drama, in your own little play of whatever circumstances you're in that God is using to his glory somehow we don't necessarily see. You need to be praising him during that trial. You need to worship him for your setbacks, which is what David did on the top of Mount Mount of Olives. You need to pray to him in all your circumstances that you might remain in his will as he walks you through the trial. See opportunity and difficulty. Learn the lesson. Trust in the Lord because God is using everything for his glory and for our good. I think it's just remarkable sometimes how the worst stories turn into these beautiful pictures and you have to, it's it's like a catch 22. 
if God hadn't had the mess, would we have had the picture or did he create the mess so that he could have the picture? I mean, at that point, you don't know. It's, it's a chicken or an egg kind of question, but clearly he's at work doing that here. And I don't think David's alone in that. We don't all get the story of Jesus in our messes, but we get some kind of story and we ought to be looking for it so that we make the most of even the bad things that come our way. All right, let's pray. It's eight o'clock. We'll do our Q and A for any who want to stick around and, and move on. Heavenly Father, uh, Father, we thank you that you have a gentle and long-suffering approach to our sin, to the mistakes we make, that you discipline, Father, but you always do it in mercy and in, in kindness. And Father, we, we regret that sometimes our, dis- our uh, mistakes push you to discipline us so hard, but Father, we are thankful that you are a good and loving Father who will take whatever steps are necessary to help us follow you in godliness. And we are amazed, Father, and we stand in awe of how you can turn even our sin into something glorious. And we ask, Father, that you allow us opportunity to use uh, our lives to glorify you in ways beyond sin, but rather in ways of righteousness. But we acknowledge, Father, you can use everything. And we, we also ask that you show us how so that we can be with you in your will, no matter what may come. Bring us back in a week to come. Help us uh, continue to learn. Perhaps encourage us with more who might want to be here with us. And Father, in all these things, help us be obedient. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.